Let's turn in our hymn books to hymn number 17 and sing this hymn. It's a good way to begin our time of worship, asking the Lord to tune our hearts to sing his praise. Come thou fount of every blessing, tune my heart to sing thy grace. Streams of mercy never ceasing, call for songs of loudest praise. Teach me some melodious sonnet sung by flaming tongues above. Praise the mount I'm fixed upon it, mount of thy redeeming love. Here I raise my Ebenezer, hither by thy help I'm come, and I hope by thy good pleasure safely to arrive at home. Jesus sought me when a stranger, wandering from the fold of God, he to rescue me from danger interposed his precious blood. Oh, to grace, how great a debtor daily I'm constrained to be. Let thy goodness, like a fetter, bind my wandering heart to thee. Prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. Here's my heart, oh, take and seal it. Seal it for thy courts above. If you will take your Bible and look with me in Genesis chapter 6 as we continue our scripture reading commentary through Genesis. My text is going to be from verse 1 down to verse 8. And this is somewhat of a controversial chapter. Not because the scriptures aren't clear, but because men tend to muddy the waters. So I pray the Lord will give us wisdom as we look here at the wickedness leading up to the days of Noah. So in verses 1 and 2, it says, And it came to pass, when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, and daughters were born unto them, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men, that they were fair, and they took them wives of all which they chose. So it says here, when men began to multiply on the face of the earth during these days of rapid population expansion, especially as we saw in the last chapter when you consider the hundreds of years of a long lifespan in what would be here the pre-flood world, here we have a problem with intermarriage between the sons of God as they're described here and the daughters of men. Now this is where things really get to be misconstrued when you go out there and read some of the interpretations because one of the most popular interpretations here is that these were angels, fallen angels that were called the sons of God in that they would have been created by God, and they saw the daughters of men. But we know from what Christ said concerning angels over in Matthew 22 that angels neither marry nor are given in marriage. It's impossible that angels should reproduce. If that were the case, then you would hear about more angels being born but they're not. They're, they were created. The number is fixed. Those that are the fallen angels and those that have been preserved 
by God. So you can automatically mark that out as being a false interpretation. I know there's a lot of what they call the Nephilim, which if you see some of the pictures of Nephilim, it looks something like out of Hollywood, big monstrous, giant fallen angels that were going around the world. And that comes from the word here later on as we're going to see that they became men of renown. So that's the word down there in verse 4, men of renown. The, they were considered to be giants, especially when it says there that in verse 4, the, there were giants in the earth in those days. That's, that's the word, Nephilim. But we're going to look at that here in a little bit. I believe just taking the scriptures for what it says, and especially in the context, 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 context. The sons of God were those from the line of Seth. That's the line that God preserved and said that from that lineage would come forth the Son of God. In other words, the Lord Jesus Christ many thousands of years later. And the daughters of men would represent then the line of Cain. And so this describes where, as it says here, the sons of Seth began to look over to the lineage of Cain and intermarry. And so you have this mixture of godly, in other words, those that God had set apart, the seed of the woman, back there in Genesis 3.15, and the ungodly, which would have been prohibited. Some say, well, why would that get God so mad to the point of he, uh, that he would destroy the world? Well, because the perversion of the lineage that would ultimately lead to the birth of the Lord Jesus was vital to God. And that's one of the things when you read in the genealogies leading up to the, the birth of Christ there in Matthew, there was a lineage, there was a line that was preserved going all the way back to Seth. And God determined that that line should stay separate. Just like today, there's no mixture between those that are the Lord's and those that aren't. There's a clear line of demarcation that is made. So this is not referring to demonic angels that somehow copulated with women and produced some sort of demonic offspring. The problem here, it says there in, in the end of verse 1, is they took them wise of all which they chose. It was necessary that God should keep that line separate, but they began to choose of themselves. And I will tell you, anytime God gives people over to their own will to determine or to choose, it's always going to be wrong. That's why it takes the Lord preserving his seed. And so we see in verses 3 and 4 then God's response to this great wickedness. He said, the Lord said, my spirit shall not always strive with man for that he also is flesh, yet his day shall be in 120 years. And there were giants in the earth in those days and also after that, when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men, they bare children to them. And here's, here's the offspring right here that relates back to verse 2, the sons of God going into the daughters of men. It says, the same became what mighty men, which were of old men of renown. It doesn't mean, and, and the word giant, we talk about giants in the land all the time. Men of history that were giants in history. It's not talking about their height or that somehow they were just these monstrous men, but the word giant is related to men of renown, giants in history. And so the Lord says here, my spirit shall not strive with man forever. God would not permit that the human race stay in this rebellious state forever. He was observing and yet all the while directing 
And at some point, it became a point of no return. We wonder the same thing when we see society. Just we wonder how, how much worse can it get? Well, it could get a lot worse. But there is a time of judgment that God has already determined. And here, when it says, my spirit will not always strive with man, don't think of a wrestling match in which man is God's rival, but the striving has to do with dealing with man's rebellion. There's a hand of restraint that God puts on sinners, even though they might not be his children, that keeps them from being as evil as they could be but that the Lord does not always have to keep his hand of restraint on sinners or on a society. At what point he just lets that society go, he himself determines. And so what we're reading here is how the Lord determined that this restraint would be no more. All the more reason for us to say today that... God's hand of restraint right now is keeping things from being worse than they could be, and yet we don't know how long it will be even for our nation that God completely destroys it. Here it said, yet his days will be 120 years. This is not the outside, is not outside the lifespan of these men that lived at this particular time, time, the flood happened 120 years after this announcement. And during that time, it says here, giants continued to be produced in those days. God had already determined that the judgment would come in 120 days, but again, he, he ordained that the evil should grow as that day of judgment approached, as Paul wrote that men are heaping wrath upon wrath against the day of wrath. And that's what we see an example of here. These men of renown would be what we would know as kings and princes, renown. World leaders, they grew from these relations between sons of God, Seth's seed, and the daughters of men, Cain's seed. There was no consideration of the boundary that God himself had put, that that seed of the woman should always be separate from the seed of the serpent. That's really the two seeds you have here. Seed of the woman is sons of God, Seth's seed. Seed of the serpent would be Cain's seed. And so, yes, there were, we know, some men of, great stature. We know about Goliath in his day. There were some that were known as giants physically. But here it says specifically that these were mighty men of old, men of renown. Just like today, as men grow in stature and power and wealth, less and less do they even consider who God is. They consider themselves to be as little gods, G-O-D-S, so that was the great wickedness that was building. We can see here in verses 5 to 8 how this grew. It says, And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him at his heart. And the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast and the creeping thing and the fowls of the air, for it repenteth me that I have made them. And then we have this precious verse right here in verse 8. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Imagine, I know we often say, well, it seems like things are getting worse and worse. It's always been since the fall. It says every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And that certainly describes our own heart. We can't point the finger out there. And here 
It just means that no aspect of man's nature was clean. When we talk about the depravity of the heart, we're not saying that man is as evil as he could be. But what we're saying is every aspect of his will and his decision is tainted with sin. That's why you can have some neighbors that are actually kind of nice and you like to get along with them. But that's still only the restraining hand of God that keeps them from being as evil as they could be. And when you hear of some that are serial killers and you wonder, well, how on earth could somebody do that? Well, you don't know your own heart. That's God taking his hand off of sinners. But either way, it's been that way from the beginning, as it says here, that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. There's none righteous, no, not one. And if anybody thinks that that excludes them, then you don't know the evil of your own heart. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? So this is a very emphatic statement of the wickedness of the human heart that to some is hardly conceivable because when you see that little baby born, you think, oh, this is such an innocent baby. No. David said that we come forth from the womb speaking lies. And so in this exploding population, every time there was an, a person born, it was more sin being added to the world. And in that sin, the constant evil in the heart, it's not just what man is outwardly, but the heart, and therefore widespread corruption and violence as it describes there in verse 11 that we'll get to next time the earth also was corrupt before God and the earth was filled with violence we hear about that today and we think that's something new it's been that way from the beginning so when it says here that the Lord repented in verse 6 it repented the Lord scriptures use human language to help us understand what we would see here as a change of mind but not of purpose it had always been God's purpose to destroy the earth on this day but the change came when he determined that it would not go on forever and let it be known that it would be 120 years and so uses human language it grieved him at his heart this gives us a view of God's attitude towards sin. It's evil. And it is nothing for God then to determine to condemn or destroy man for his evil thoughts and works. You'll hear people say that God loves the sinner but hates the sin. You can't separate the two. Here he clearly hates the sinner and the sin, because of the sin, because of what it is to be a sinner. When it says, it repenteth me that I have made them, it's speaking there again in human language that the word repent means to have a 180 degree turn from what you had been doing to this point and now going the other way. So it's not a change in God's purpose, but it is a change in God's direction. That he determined now, he'd always determined that it'd be 120 years, but he would now work toward that destruction. But in all of this, this is what I love about reading the scriptures, to see these verses such as we have here, but Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Notice it doesn't say he found merit. It's not that out of all of this evil generation, somehow Noah was walking in perfection. There wasn't any. None righteous, no, not one. And if you, if you don't believe that, just look what Noah did after he had been spared in the ark with his family. He no sooner got out than he got drunk and the uh, sons, Ham, observed him in his nakedness and it brought condemnation on 
Ham's seed, which was Canaan. And even that God purposed because the Canaanites, God had determined that he would destroy them in time. So while God had purpose to cleanse the, the earth with this judgment, yet here was one who found grace in the eyes of the Lord, whose sin, it wasn't just that God would overlook it, but his sin, God purpose, should be put upon that righteous seed that should come from that lineage of Seth many thousands of years later, and that would be the Lord Jesus Christ. In the Old Testament, God didn't just overlook the sin in order to deliver these, but it's the non-imputation of their sin. He did not put it to their account because he had purposed that it should be put to the account of his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. But here it says, Noah found grace. It wasn't that Noah went out looking for it and said, ah, I found grace. But it's a way of speaking that grace was found of him. In other words, he didn't earn it, but God purposed that he should find it because of his purpose to deliver him. No one earns grace. can't be merited. But we find it when God's pleased to open our hearts and teach us of Christ. And what was true then is true today. Here's the glorious good news of the gospel that where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. That's what Paul said there in Romans 5.20. How? In the Lord Jesus Christ. So all of this is important, this lineage, what we're studying here, God cleansing the entire world but sparing Noah and his family that from them should come again that lineage that would lead to the Lord Jesus Christ, particularly through Shem, the Shemites, from which Abraham would come. And then through Abraham, seed, ultimately, the Lord Jesus Christ. Gracious Father, I thank you for your word, how precious it is to read it and to study it, looking for Christ, looking for your grace and mercy in him towards sinners. And though the world itself was in total perversion at this time, yet there was Noah that you preserved by your grace and caused that he should know you. So I pray, dear Father, that as we consider our own selves, if you've been merciful to us, we have to say it's for Christ's sake alone and not anything in us. And for that, we give you the praise and honor and glory. And I ask that you would help us as we continue to worship to see Christ in all his glory as you revealed him in your word. And we give you the praise and honor in his precious name. Amen. <clears throat> Let's take our hymn books and turn to hymn number 296. I know Noah certainly would have sung this had the hymn been around in his day. All the way, my Savior leads me. What have I to ask beside? All the way my Savior leads me, what have I to ask beside? Can I doubt his tender mercy, who through life has been my guide? Heavenly peace, divinest comfort, here by faith in him to dwell. For I know whate'er befall me, Jesus who with all things well. For I know whate'er befall me, Jesus do with all things well. All the way my Savior leads me, cheers each winding path I tread. Gives me grace for every trial, feeds me with the living bread. Though my weary steps may falter, and my soul a thirst may be, gushing from the rock before me, lo, a spring of joy I see. 
Gushing from the rock before me, lo, a spring of joy I see. All the way my Savior leads me, oh, the fullness of his love. Perfect rest to me is promised in my Father's house above. When my spirit clothed immortal wings its flight to realms of day, this my song through endless ages, Jesus led me all the way. This my song through endless ages, Jesus led me all the way. Not only led us, but carries us, as the shepherd does his sheep. <clears throat> well, look with me in your Bibles to Isaiah 33. We'll begin here with this text. And I want to speak with you about Christ the lawgiver. We've left the K's now. Where we've looked at a number of messages, the titles concerning Christ the king. But now the L, Christ the lawgiver. We see this in Isaiah chapter 33 and verse 22. As I said, we'll begin with this scripture and then go through other scriptures to see how Christ is set forth in this way. Isaiah chapter 33 and verse 22 says, for the Lord is our judge. Notice capital L-O-R-D. The Lord is our lawgiver. The Lord is our king. Judge, lawgiver, and king. And therefore what? He will save us. Those that contest against God being sovereign in salvation, are really kicking against salvation itself because were God not sovereign in salvation and could it be that somehow man could thwart God's purpose in salvation, then he wouldn't be God. And so this is vital here when we see Christ set forth in the second part as our law giver. We've already seen him as judge. We've seen him as king. Those are titles that we've looked at already. So this is somewhat summarizing all three together. And as I've encouraged you in reading, wherever you see capital L-O-R-D, that is Jehovah, and it means I am. And when you come to the New Testament, that's where we see that the I am of the Old Testament is none other than the Lord Jesus Christ himself, where he says, I am the door, I am the shepherd, the I am. Christ said to the Pharisees, except you believe that I am, you shall die in your sins. So again, wherever you see capital L-O-R-D, all of the revelation of God is in his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. So just go ahead and put Christ there, for Christ is our judge. Our Lord made that plain when he said, The Father judges no man, this is in the gospel according to John, but has put all judgment into his hand. Christ our judge. And again, Christ our lawgiver. When you think about the law of Moses, and you think about Moses being up on that mountain, how the scriptures say that he spoke face to face with God. He was speaking face to face with the Lord Jesus Christ, even though Christ had not yet come. Because God himself said, no man can see my face and live. So the only way that Moses himself could have met with God as friend with friend would have been in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. But it was the Lord that was giving him that law. And that law could not be changed, even though while Moses was on the mountain, the children of Israel were down there building a golden calf and worshiping it. 
And Moses threw it down and broke the tablets. And then God had them written again. But rather than being put in Moses' hand, the second time it was put in the Ark of the Covenant. Where all those years, that blood on the Day of Atonement was sprinkled upon that Ark as a type and picture of the work of the Lord Jesus Christ, the mercy seat. The Ark was the, the base, the cover was the mercy seat, all made with gold. Those are all types and pictures of the Lord Jesus Christ. But he is the law giver. Unlike men today, they come up with a law, but they themselves don't subject themselves to it. It's rules for thee, but not for me. That's the way our leaders are, but not with God, not with Christ. He was not only the law giver, established it, but then in time he actually came and submitted himself to that law and earned that righteousness necessary for God the Father to declare righteous that people for whom he died. So he's the law giver, but he's also the law keeper. That's why today, if the Lord Jesus has paid our sin debt, we're free, free from the law, happy condition. It wasn't just set aside, but the very lawgiver himself came and obeyed it that the Father might be just to justify. And then with that is the Lord is our king. As king, he's sovereign. He directs who he condemns by that law and who it is that he's pleased to save. So as you get over into the New Testament, this is where we see Christ himself establishing himself as that lawgiver. The Pharisees found fault with him because they thought he had come to set aside the law. But if you look with me in Matthew chapter 5 and verse 17, as the lawgiver, he did not set aside the law, but he came to fulfill it. In Matthew 5, 17, our Lord says to these religious Leaders of the day do not think that I have come, he said, to abolish the law or the prophets, but, and the word there is to destroy, I am not come to destroy but to fulfill. Why would he destroy the law that he himself established in the Old Testament? For verily I say unto you, in verse 18, until heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle, a jot and a tittle were the little punctuation marks on the Hebrew language. can make an entirely different meaning of a word if, if one is left off, just like a little apostrophe. And so not one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from all till it be till all be fulfilled. Well, when was it fulfilled? It was fulfilled when Christ in his life earned and established it. And then when he died, he paid its penalty. And thereby God was satisfied and imputed his righteous work to the account, the spiritual account of everyone going all the way back to Adam, all the way through Noah and David, all those in the Old Testament, everyone since that God has elected unto salvation. And he says in verse 19, Whoever, whosoever therefore shall break one of these least commandments. See, that's what the Pharisees were doing. They were changing the nature of the law. They were saying that, well, murder is not really murder unless you murder somebody. Well, that's why our Lord in Matthew 5 through 7, again, as the lawgiver, who better to explain the law than the lawgiver? And so all of those teachings of Christ that they called the Sermon on the Mount were really addressed at men who were changing the commandments, lowering the standard, if you will. But the Lord said, if a man so much as say, Araka, thou fool, that he has committed sin against the law, has become a murderer or to look upon a woman and lust after her in his own heart, become an adulterer. 
And here he says, if any do that and teach men so, he shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. In fact, least so much that he's not even part of the kingdom of heaven. That's the sense there. But whosoever shall do and teach them, the same shall be great in the kingdom of heaven. Who's he talking about there? He's talking about himself. I'm not talking about any. There's nobody among men that could say they've ever done and taught the law in such a way now as to be considered great in the kingdom of heaven. There's only one great one in the kingdom of heaven. That's Christ. So Christ, in declaring this, whosoever shall do and teach them, he's speaking of himself. He didn't set aside the law, but came to establish it. He shall be called great. The same Christ shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. And he says, for I say unto you that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees. That means it has to be something more than just outward, visible efforts at righteousness. There it says, ye shall in no case enter the kingdom of heaven. That's, that explains, shall be called the least. It means he's not even going to be there. Don't even look for him. How is it that our righteousness can exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees? Again, it's in the righteousness that Christ came and earned and established as the lawgiver and the law keeper. And therefore, our righteousness is in him. So let's come back here to my text in Isaiah 33. In connection with Christ as the lawgiver, when you think of law, don't you think of a judge? one that's seated upon the bench, the supreme judge who rules in his courtroom. Well, Christ's courtroom is the, the court of heaven. And his reign, his rule is over all, not just his church that he came and redeemed, but all the world is under his rulership and under his law. Even as... The Lord Jesus said there in John that all judgment had been committed unto him by the Father. And therefore, he judges his people. How does he judge his people? I know for years that I was taught and somehow believed that when Christ died on the cross, that was just for your sins past. But now, if you continued as a sinner, which you did, then you had to make sure that you somehow kept your account close. Otherwise, you would be judged in the end. You wouldn't be judged as the world, we were told, to be cast into hell fire. But all of your works would be judged. And anything that wasn't perfect then would be burned up with fire. Well, that would be everything because there's none righteous, no, not one. You can see how foolish that is type of thinking is for Christ to be when it says here in verse 22 of Isaiah 33 for the Lord is our judge he's our defender <laughs> he's our advocate and therefore the conclusion in verse 22 he will save us isn't that a great sense that no matter what charge might be brought against you in the court of law of God's court of law, the matter's already been settled. There's nothing on your record. Go down to the courthouse and check it out. Look for your name down there amongst the, the criminals or defendants. You won't find it. Why? Because Christ has already borne it. That's such a the beautiful thought about Christ being the judge here. So not only is he the judge, but he's the lawgiver. Can you imagine arguing with a judge and the judge saying, well, I wrote the law. Why are you arguing with me over that? See, men will always try to use the law against others. They want to condemn others, and yet they don't see themselves as being condemned. They're always busy about trying to take the little speck out of the other person's eye, and yet they don't even see the beam in their own, is the way Christ put it. I'm thankful that we don't have to live that way, because Christ as the judge, Christ as the lawgiver, He's the one that determines saved or condemned. And I'll tell you this, so complete was his work when he came to this earth and earned and established that righteousness 
necessary before a holy God that when he finished that work, there remained nothing but righteousness that was imputed to the account of his people. And there is therefore now no condemnation. That's directly from the lawgiver himself. So let men contest as they will, yet this is Christ himself that makes this declaration. Over in Galatians chapter 4, in verses 4 through 6, this is such a beautiful portion. Paul had a lot of legalists that were following him around like wild dogs, nipping away and trying to undermine the message of grace and Christ that he was declaring. But he says here in verse 4 through 6, Galatians 4, 4 through 6, but when the fullness of the time was come. Well, who set the fullness of the time? That was set from before the foundation of the world. That was God the Father determining that in the fullness of the time, his son should come into this world. And so God sent forth his son. God the Father sent forth his son. The son is God, but here it's speaking in reference to the triune God. God the Father sent forth his son made of a woman. Why was that necessary? Well, because he needed to be the seed of a woman. All the way back there in Genesis 3.15. That's why it was necessary that that lineage be kept separate in Seth. All the way down to Christ. But look at here. Made under the law. Here's why I say that men establish laws and then try to do all they can to work around it. No, he was made under the very law of which he is the law giver. He had to come and fulfill it in every jot and tittle, not only in word and deed, but the very thought. See, people talking all the time about standing before God and hoping that their good deeds outweigh the bad. Well, that, you don't have any good deeds, so that's strike one. And then you don't have any good thoughts. You don't have any good words. You don't have any good deeds. You don't have any good thoughts. Strike three, you're out. The very thoughts, but Christ, the lawgiver, came and subjected himself to that law. He established it and thereby honored it. That's how the scriptures refer to it. He honored the law, made it honorable. And then it says here to do what in verse 5? To redeem, to pay the ransom price, to redeem them that were under the law. Until Christ paid the debt, even the elect were under the condemnation of God's law because satisfaction hadn't been made. And therefore, as long as the, the law stood, it stood against them. But here, there was a change when Christ paid the ransom. Why? That we might receive the adoption of sons. That we might receive the adoption. When was the adoption handled it was done when christ died the debt was paid and therefore verse six because your sons god has sent forth his the spirit of his son into your hearts crying abba father you see the work of the triune god god the father purposing it god the son fulfilling it and uh, god the spirit revealing this great work of the lord jesus christ and in time that's what we see. The Spirit takes that very law and writes it on the hearts of his elect. And uh, therefore the redeemed ones, now with the Spirit of God in them, they live to his honor and glory. They're not looking to fulfill it themselves. They wouldn't even begin to try, but they look to him who did fulfill it. And that's the Lord Jesus Christ. That's how he's the judge. This matter's already been judged. Christ said when he was going to the cross, now is the prince of this world cast out. So there's nothing that can stand against any one of God's children. And that's straight from the lawgiver himself. That comes on good record. And uh, therefore we can rest and rejoice. And then thirdly, we've already seen this one, the Lord as king. It says there in Isaiah 33, 
in verse 22. He's the judge. He's the law giver. But he's also our king. And you notice, going back there to Isaiah 33, the word our, that is pertaining to those that God himself has declared to be his children by election, by redemption, and by revelation of his spirit. He's our judge. What a blessing to know the judge. I've heard some people that have gotten in trouble with the law. And that's the first thing they're asking. So, hey, do you know the judge at all? Do you know is there anything? Can you kind of get me in and get me out? That's man trying to finagle around it. We know the judge. Sure we do. In Christ. And if he's paid our sin debt, we're not trying to sneak around and try to get his favor. His, his favor's already been put upon us. And he's the lawgiver. He wrote the law. And he's our king, and therefore he will say. But you notice our, our, our. That's not everybody can say it. Men might be able to say he's the judge or he's the lawgiver or he's the king as if referring to something they know but yet has never been taught in their hearts. We know because it's been made so. And so as the king, that's how he's been made so by the Father. If you go back there to Psalm 2 in verses 6 through 9, Christ is not up for election, by the way. He's not. We're not going around trying to get people to sign up and Vote for Jesus. Nope. This was already settled well before any of us were born. Here in Psalm chapter 2. Notice again when you read these scriptures, it pertains to Christ. We know that because this very portion was quoted by, in the New Testament by the church as they prayed in the book of Acts. Why do the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed. So against God as God and his anointed, which is Christ, the anointed one. That's the word Christ means. Saying, let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us. That's how man is born, a rebel. They said of Christ when he came to this earth, we will not have this man to what? Reign over us. He didn't come like some little Jesus, want to be Savior, offering himself and hope that somehow people would accept him. Like preachers going around today, doing God a favor, accept Jesus as your Savior. No. He came to rule. They say, let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us. That's what man is always going to do. Whatever law you put in front of him, he's going to break it. He's not going to keep it. But here it says, he that sitteth in the heavens shall laugh. Who's that? Christ. This is before he even came. The Lord shall have them in derision. And as I said in the book of Acts, chapter 4, this particular portion of scripture was what they prayed back to the father when they saw the persecution and it specifically states that the kings of the earth were none other than Pilate and Herod that plotted against him sought to be rid of him the Jewish people the Romans none was accepted and yet here it says he that sitteth in heaven shall laugh I like to picture that whenever things are seemingly out of sorts here they're not out of sorts for the king of kings and lord of lords, the judge, the ruler, the lawgiver, he'll have them in derision. So quit acting like an unbeliever whenever things get unsettled and start trying to figure things out yourself. Then shall he speak unto them in what? His wrath and vex them in his sore displeasure. Any for whom Christ has not paid the debt they continue under the wrath of God. That's who he is as sovereign, as judge, as a lawgiver, as king. 
but any for whom he came and paid to sin debt, there is no wrath. So this is not speaking of any of his children here. When he says, then shall he speak unto them in his wrath. Yes, we were all rebels at one point, but God showed mercy. Here it says in verse 6, yet have I set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. There's the father speaking of the son. As the judge, as the lawgiver, as the king, I have set. The sense there is that it was he was set at some point and continues to be set. There's nobody un, unsetting him. And he says, I will declare the decree. The Lord has said unto me, Thou art my son. This day have I begotten thee. And the book of Acts again speaks of that begetting of the son, referring to his resurrection. He died, he came to die, and rose again. The only begotten son of God. Ask of me, and I shall give thee the heathen, that is the nations, for thine inheritance. And the uttermost parts of the earth for thy possession. Even though he came unto his own, the Jews, and his own received him not, and brought condemnation on themselves, where Christ said, your house is left to you desolate. Yet, here in verse 8, it's clear that God has always had a people among the nations that he has elected. And for whom Christ prayed, ask of me and I will give thee, I will give thee. Had Christ come and prayed for every single person in the world, like you hear people saying, then there would be none judged. But he only, and when it says ask of me, he only asked of his father what the father had purposed to give him. And if that's you or me, that's God's grace. I didn't have anything to do with it. But him, as the judge, as the lawgiver, as the king, it says, Thou shalt break them with a rod of iron. Thou shalt dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Who's he talking about there? The vessels of wrath. Be wise now, therefore, O ye kings, and be instructed. Judges of the earth. Those are those men of renown for which God destroyed the earth one time, first time. But now here we are again. All these years later, men think themselves somewhat. Well, beware, be wise. Serve the Lord, capital L-O-R-D, with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the Son. You see how God has purposed that the Son be honored? Lest he be angry. This is a Jesus that this world doesn't know about. Over there in Revelation, he's referred to as the the wrath of the Lamb. Most people think of the Lamb as being so gentle. Well, he came to lay down his life as the Lamb of God, but he's a God of wrath against those that oppose him. And when his wrath is kindled but a little, it doesn't take anything for God just to exercise his wrath and execute his judgment. And every time he takes an unbelieving sinner out of this world, he's executed his wrath. But a little, it's nothing compared to what awaits them on the other side. But blessed are all they that put their trust in him. Oh, I'm so thankful to be able to trust in him that the Father has made to be the judge. Him who is the law giver and in whose hands his church is held. It's his church. It's his people, and he's the judge, he's the king, he's the lawgiver. What's, you say, well, what's the law of the church? Well, the law of the church is to look to Christ and not to your own righteousness. It's to be found in him, not having your own righteousness, but that which is of God by faith. We'll come back to wrap this up with scripture we saw recently in 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 15. See, all these are connected with what we've already studied. Oh, the kingship of Christ, 1 Timothy 6 and verse 15. It says, which in his times he shall show, speaking of the Lord Jesus Christ, who is the blessed and only potate, 
the king of kings and the Lord of lords. That word potentate is the word judge, a lawgiver. And the church, his people, that's what the church is. It's his people that he's chosen and redeemed. He rules and reigns over them, and I'm happy to have it so. But it says here in verse 16, who only hath immortality, dwelling in the light which no man can approach unto, when no man, whom no man has seen nor can see, to whom be honor and power everlasting. Amen. Who's he speaking of there? I'll go up into context. Verse 14, that thou keep this commandment without spot, unrebukable, until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ. You say, what commandment? Well, to give glory to Christ, Christ alone. And that's what his people do when he has so revealed himself in them. He saved us by his shed blood. He does yet save us. Nothing can ever remove us from what that bloodshed of the Lord Jesus Christ has accomplished and will yet save us. When the scripture says, he that persevereth unto the end shall be saved, it's not your persevering that is the cause of your salvation, but it's the evidence that you'll not ever turn away because Christ has been pleased to reveal himself in you. And that's from every enemy, the world, Satan, but also your own flesh, which is the greatest enemy. We're talking about an everlasting salvation that the law giver has purposed and the law keeper has accomplished on behalf of his people. All right. Pray that's a blessing. I know it's been an encouragement to, to me to be able to prepare it and preach it. Let's turn in our hymn books to hymn number 62. Crown him with many crowns. There's not enough crowns in order to glorify him. Crown him with many crowns, the lamb upon his throne. Hark how the heavenly anthem drowns all music but its own. Awake my soul and sing of him who died for and hail him as thy matchless king through all eternity. Crown him the Lord of love, behold his hands and side, rich wounds yet visible above, in beauty glorified. No angel in the sky can fully bear that sight but downward bends his wandering eye at mystery so bright crown him the lord of life who triumphed o'er the grave who rose victorious to the strife for those he came to save, his glories now we sing, who died and rose on high, who died eternal life to bring, and lives that death may die. Crown him the Lord of heaven, one with the Father knows. Spirit through him give from yonder glorious throne to thee be endless praise for thou for us hast died be thou O Lord through endless days adored and magnified Amen. Alright, we'll be dismissed and Look forward to the next time, Lord willing.